cue for Bournemouth. The roof of the gold sands is raised. Everyone here knows what that could mean to this football. Well, hello there, guys. Welcome to another video on Back of the Net. Sorry we're a bit later than planned, a few technical issues, but we are all good. Welcome to the latest in the live shows. We appreciate you joining us once again for this regular spot on a Sunday. Just want to say thanks for all your comments on the interview with Brett Pittman. It was uh, really good to hear from a goal-scoring hero of ours. And also with Jan Kermigant coming up on Thursday, uh, we've certainly got an eye for a goal scorer. And this video tonight is no different as we've got a player who is simply Mr. AFC Bournemouth. The word legend is, well, it's often overused, but Steve Fletcher encompasses the spirit of AFC Bournemouth with a determination to overcome adversity. His own footballing path wasn't easy, but a combination of loyalty and resolve led to a career which has been littered with outstanding moments, both as an individual, but also as a team scoring playoff final goals, gracing Wembley and netting momentous club defining goals are just a number of high moments in amongst a career which has seen a willingness to prevail through the bad times, including administration and minus 17. And to add to the story, two seasons of football which took him away from the club that he adored. Now, as a coach and club and as a club ambassador in the Premier League, he now works amongst the world's elite footballers. And it is fair to say that Steve Fletcher has, well, he's pretty much done it all, hasn't he? But does he have any regrets? We'll find out as we're going to be chatting to the man who gave us some phenomenal experiences like these. Absolutely love that goal. How many times have you watched it, Fletch? Um, truthfully, uh... yeah. Yeah, a few hundred times. Yeah. It makes me feel good. When I had some down times, I always put videos like that on and thought, you know what, I'll brighten my deal. You went in a bit heavy with Wade Elliott with the headbutt afterwards to celebrate, didn't you? Well, do you know what happened? I cut his face. Now, in today's game, he'd have, he'd have had to go off the pitch to get it treated to. So when I grabbed yeah. his head, obviously yeah. just sheer excitement, I dug my nails into his neck and I cut right down the side of his neck here with my nails. I don't know what I did. I just grabbed him and put my headbutt on him, yeah, I think it was just all the build-up of everything with the game and wanting to so badly, sick of being a loser so many times and the Neely, Neely man and the Neely team, um, just all that emotion poured out of what was, what, 15 years at the club, 2003, yeah. so yeah, it was like, uh, yeah, I think weird. Weird was a bit upset with me afterwards. He was like, <laughs> Well, one thing it. that um, later in the interview we'll talk about is that you have always seemed to encompass what all our fans are feeling in the stands. Uh, and one of the fans that we've got with us today is Tom Jordan, North Stand season ticket holder. Tom, how are you? Oh, good, Sam, folks. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. And also, yeah. uh, Jeff Hayward, podcast colleague, is here as well. Jeff, how's it going? Yeah, very good, Sam. Thank you. So, Fletch, it's... it's really difficult to know really where to begin. Um, so much to cover. Um, and we've also had a load of questions that are coming in and this is live. So the questions will uh, keep coming in during the show as well. But we'll start with one that's actually been submitted by uh, Cherries fan, Steve Butler, who you might know. And he said, between yourself and your granddad, Jack, you have a total of a thousand and four appearances. Was he your main inspiration in becoming a professional footballer? Um, yes, I would say so. Um... My dad's side of the family, which is obviously the Fletcher side, um, they went really into sport as much. My dad's probably more into doing the garden and he liked, you know, working with technical things, machinery. Um, but obviously he followed me everywhere and he took me out onto the fields and played football with him. But my granddad obviously playing for England. Being a professional footballer, I mean, he won the FA Cup final. The only time Derby County had won it in 1946, they beat Charlton in the final 4-1. Uh, we've got the FA Cup winners medal in the family. I've got all his caps from England. I've found all the memorabilia over the years. Some phenomenal, phenomenal stuff I have here at home. Um, obviously, I never reached the heights of my granddad, but he was the one who would sit with me, talk me about football, then in the back garden when my friends were all out doing things they shouldn't. Uh, around the streets of Hartlepool, I'd be just... Learning the basics, you know, like chest control, half volleys back, left foot, right foot, just just basic things in the garden. And when you're a young lad, you don't realise how important they are. 
um, just learning the basics, you know, putting them implements in, in, in place for, for when you grow into your teens, because I was probably six or seven doing this in the back garden. Um, and people say, well, that's the basics of football, but yeah, but you can never do the basics enough. And um, I've read a lot of things and watched a lot of things on top sportsmen over the years, and they've always said the same thing. But it's not until you trigger your mind back to those instances um, and those times, and you think, I saw, obviously, I didn't do it on the level of the top, top boys in every sport, but I still did them. Um, and I think back, like I say, I, I was in the back garden daily, just practicing. If my granddad wasn't there, I'd be doing it up against the wall, banging the ball backwards and forwards, control, touch, pass, left foot, right foot. Yeah. And at the time, like you say, you just think you're kicking the ball about, but you're not. You're 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 learning mm. the basis of your skills, and that took me into my teens, and then obviously as, as, into a professional career of 23 years. So, yeah, my granddad was a, was the biggest influence, I think. Yeah. Was there a particular centre forward, Fletch, that you modelled your game on? I'm not goal scorers, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Harsh um, on yourself. I was a huge Liverpool fan, and still am to a degree. I mean, it's a little bit different now. Um, but Liverpool were my team and I used to get upset every time they got beat, which wasn't very often in the 80s. But Ian Rush, I know obviously I was a totally different player, um, you know, I, because of the size of me and what my attributes and the attributes I did, didn't have. But I just loved Ian Rush and Kenny Daglish. They were my heroes. Kenny Daglish was my overall hero. But as a striker, I loved Liverpool and Ian Rush through the 80s. He was just a goal machine. Um, later on in life, as I grew into my late teens and I was trying to get into football and I realised I wasn't going to be an Ian Rush type player, obviously. Um, you start to look at other players. So I looked at people like Mark Hately and he was a big lad and he put himself about and he got the odd goal or two. And um, not, I didn't try and mirror my game specifically on anyone, but I watched them type of strikers, even the likes of like Lee Chapman uh, and yeah, Lee, Jim, Lee because Jim, right. it was pointless. Me, it was pointless me watching... Ian Rush, because I couldn't do what Ian Rush could do, but I was looking at the, the top level players who were very similar, as in target men, etc., etc., and tried to, you know, bring my game to that. I tell you, one of the best players I ever watched um, holding the ball up was Mark Hughes. How he used his body to back into defenders. He was as strong as an ox, and uh, maybe didn't have my height, but he was so strong. And I used to watch him thinking, he just doesn't give the ball away. He, the, the ball yeah. sticks to him every single time. And I've got to try and learn to do that for my team because that was my big attribute. Mm. So tell us about the 22nd of July, 1992, because you were doing some pre-season training, second year as a professional at Hartlepool. Um, and then Alan Murray, the then Hartlepool manager, he called you into his office. Can you explain that conversation and... Uh, you know, what happened after that? Because that was the conversation that basically, um, you know, started off your move, wasn't it? It changed my life, mate. Mm. As simple as that. Changed my life. Um, yeah, it's 28 years this July. It's crazy. Uh, I went into the office, it was halfway or midway through pre season. Um, uh, I'd signed a second year as a professional. Um, wow, look at that curly bar. Mate. <laughs> Beautiful. I have, curly, I have curly hair, by the way. I have to put the straightness through it to get any <laughs> movement in it. Um, <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, so I guess I went into the office and uh, got called in um, on the morning and I thought, oh dear, what have I done wrong? Uh, we were, like say, halfway through my pre-season, which would have been my third season as a professional. I'd signed the third, third year as a, as a professional contract. I was 19 years of age, um, just yeah. before my 20th birthday, which would have been the 26th of July. Um, and I come in and Alan Murray sat me down and just said, Fletch, I've had a a, um, a call from Tony Pulis. Um, no disrespect, I didn't know who Tony Pulis was. He'd only taken over as manager after Harry Redknapp went to, to obviously to West Ham, and he said from Bournemouth. And I was like, "All oh, right, wow, my, as you can imagine, I'm a hometown lad, living with my mum and dad. My heart just sunk because obviously I knew he was going to say, you know, what are your thoughts. And straight away I thought, no, I don't, I don't want to go. No, 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 I'm not moving yeah. to Bournemouth. It's uh, one is too far around the down the country, and, and I hadn't got my head around it. I'd literally been in the office two minutes, and he said, "Look," he said, "Why don't you go down? Spoke to the board. Uh, they're offering thirty thousand plus twenty thousand, fifty thousand in total." He said, "And if you want to go," he said, "Let me know." He said, "I spoke to the board. They're not happy about you going." He said, "But I just feel that with the two strikers we had at the time, which was Joe Allen and Paul Baker, um, very good at that level." 
He said that I wasn't in his immediate plans. But if I, to be fair to Alan Murray, he said to me, if it doesn't work out in Bournemouth and you go down and you don't have a good feel for it, he said, you've got your contract here for the year and we'll see how it goes. Um, he said, so you've got nothing to lose. So I went back, spoke to my parents and, you know, looking back now, it's obviously Alan was saying basically, not, there's no harsh way of saying it, but he didn't really want me um, in his plans going forward because I'd actually signed for Cyril Knowles was the manager who signed me as a young lad and the late Cyril, um, he passed away from a brain tumour. It was horrendous. I was absolutely devastated and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be doing this interview now. I probably wouldn't have been a footballer. I'd have been turned away because I was injured all of my second year as a, as a youth team player and he only saw me play for 12 minutes um, <laughs> on, my, wow. on my return from injury and I got injured again. He got me in the office at the end of the season and just said, I like the look here. He like big, strong lads. And he said, I'm going to take a gamble on you. And literally, I went from playing no games in my second year as a, a youth team player, a handful of reserve games, and then I was in the first team straight away. So if it wasn't for Cyril, you know, I probably wouldn't have been a professional probably. But anyway, I went down to Bournemouth, Tony Pulis. There was no mobile phones back in the day, so we had to... Stop at a service station and phone my mum and yeah. let her know while we were getting on. And I didn't realise how far Bournemouth was. You can imagine it's 336 miles or something. Door to door, so it took us about six hours. It was a hot day, beautiful day. And Tony guided us in and gave us some instructions. We've written them down how to get there. And he put us up in the Royal Bath, which was very nice back in the day. Um, yeah. Made me come in down from the West Cliff, so you know he strategically knew exactly what he was doing. Because when I saw that beach, mate, I looked at my dad. And my <laughs> yeah, I ain't going back. I know Hartley pulls on the cars, but it's, it's, <laughs> this is like going to a different country. I said to my dad, "This is like going over to Spain. It's unbelievable." And it was red hot. It was, it was beautiful. And then we stayed overnight. He even told us to go to a lovely restaurant, and I was like, felt like royalty. It was like I'd never had anything like this before. Went to the training grounds. Met the old um, groundsman, kit man and captain. Um, I know he passed away not long ago, but he, he greeted me and I just thought it was really friendly, really welcoming. And um, met up with Tony, took me around the training ground, which was Chapel Gate at the time. Um, just felt, I just, I just felt wanted, I felt needed. And yeah. um, that day I signed about three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't obviously not for the money or anything because, oh yeah, I think I was on... £110 a week at Hartlepool and I think Bournemouth doubled my money or maybe a little bit more it wasn't about that it was about giving an opportunity being wanted and the excitement of being a new player so yes it was daunting because I was 19 and yeah. I know players move around a lot now but maybe not so much 28 years ago and especially not from one end of the country to the other but we literally drove back at 3 o'clock I think we got home about 9, 10 and um, that would have been the Thursday, and I drove back down on the Friday for training. Yeah, my God. <laughs> yeah, set off at, I set off at four o'clock in the morning. And I got to Bournemouth about nine. Long day. For traffic, and I started training. And then the very next day, we had Aston Villa in a pre season friendly, in which I scored. We drew 1 1. Um, and I, I believe it or not, I swear. Then I drove straight back to Hartlepool after the game. <laughs> <laughs> The roads, the roads are not like the way now. That Newbury bypass wasn't there. No. It was horrendous. And I got home after the games. So I left at five, quarter past five. I got home about half ten. And I drove back down Sunday night ready for training on the Monday. I'd done... That's ridiculous. I worked out, I'd done over 2,000 miles there and back. <laughs> in four Crazy. And then I, um... I came back on the Sunday night. I was cemented and I went and lived in digs with our other old kit man, Nimbus, Ken Sullivan. I stayed with him like everybody has from Jermaine Defoe, Jason Tindall. We've all stayed there, Stephen Purchase. Uh, I was there for three months before I moved permanently with a family in Queen's Park Avenue in Diggs, um, which I was there for two years before I got my own place. But yeah, it was, um, and there was no mobiles back in the day, so I couldn't phone my parents. I had to ask the landlady, Nimbus's wife. I've been using wow. the phone every night uh, to phone my parents. So it was literally thrown in at the deep end, as you can imagine. Yeah, it's, it's quite funny when you say that Tony Pulis sort of guided you in to go like via the west cliff and get the most uh, most scenic route into town and obviously the draw the actual town is a big draw um for players and is it right that um eddie used to do this and give certain players a sort of drive around the area before you know making him sign on the dotted line 
Yeah. But no, but you're right straight away. It's a big pull because mm. I, said, I told you I turned around to my dad and said I don't think I'll be coming back. And then <laughs> I hadn't even I hadn't even got to the hotel. I hadn't even spoken to Tony. Seen seen the town, seen the stadium. I just seen the beach and the sunshine, and I was like, wow, this is mm. amazing. It felt I did feel like I was going into another country. I remember I'm you know a hardly cool mm. lad. And really been out of Hartlepool much, uh, you know what I mean. But I mean, I travelled, but obviously not into big cities, towns, uh, especially not as far down the south as as Bournemouth. But yeah, we we have videos. We show the the new players about the town. People talking about it. Myself is in the videos. Eddie, the chairman, the players. How lovely it is around here because especially the players now who maybe don't know Bournemouth so much need to know what what is around. How how they can commute and get out of town. And yeah. we got a drone. We flew it. Well, we didn't. The company did, and they flew it over the beaches and the New Forest. Because it is a big pull for a club mm. like us, you know, because we're a small town, a small club. Um, you need the pull, and for me, the two big pulls for Bournemouth signing here is well. Yes, we're in the Premier League now, of course. That's another one. But back in the day, was it was the town and Eddie Howe as a manager because they know they're going to come, they're going to get yeah. great coaching, they're going to develop as players technically, um, and obviously the area you've got to use what you've got. Yeah, um, we've got we have got it in abundance down here, haven't we? And um, I drove Mark Travers. So how many years ago was that? Now two, three coming up, three yeah. maybe. He had his family come up from Ireland, and I was doing my ambassador role, and I said to him, "Look, I'll I'll pick them up." So I picked up Mark, his brother, his mum and dad, and I took them all around from Christchurch Pool, showed them all around, and told I was I was truthful and honest about it, and they absolutely fell in love with the place straight away. Yeah, amazing. Um, and, yeah, so we, we do do it. I mean, maybe not the more experienced players. We don't have to, you know, I'm not going to bring Callum Wilson and take him around as such. But I'm always there for advice and telling him what's what. But the young lads especially, yeah, because they need to know what their parents, when they're obviously leaving home like I did. Mike left home at like 17 or whatever, 16. There's a lot of worry for a parent. Mm-hmm. I've got two daughters now with 22 and, and 19, so I can imagine... What it's like when their when their son moves away, especially from a new. Say, if we take Mike Travis, for instance, from a different country, in Ireland, and uh, I just wanted to make them feel at home, put put his mum's mind at rest. How nice the place is, and yes, it's a uh, it is a pull down here, and had a major factor in me signing. That's for sure. Mm. Jeff, in, in uh, that Tony Pulis uh, first couple of years, Steve. It, things didn't really go according to plan. I think it'd be fair to say. I mean, you you struggled a bit. Did you did you ever think? Oh, I've made a bit of a mistake here. Um, right. So the first year, it started off really well. Um, got a goal in the first home game against Port Vale, one two one. Um, got a goal away. Oh God, I'm going back now. Twenty eight years, lads. So someone might tell me I'm wrong. I think I got an away goal at Mansfield or. Somewhere, like I think it was Mansfield, mm. on a Tuesday night. And I was all right. I'd scored like two goals in the first four or five games. Then I got a bad injury to my knee, my left knee. And as you, and I'm not going to disrespect anyone, but you can imagine the treatment I got back then. Nothing. I mean, it's, not, it's a million miles from what they get now. And we came, I, I was out for a while, about four to five weeks. And I knew it wasn't right. And we were playing West Brom. We were top of the league. And Tony wanted me back to play up front with Efna Kuku and I came back and I should have said no and I said yes and my knee wasn't right. And from that moment on, because I wanted to play so badly, I played through the pain and that knee has gone on to, well, obviously it it didn't stop me playing for 23 years, but it should have, but it limited me massively and to this day, it's still horrendous um, and I have to monitor it. The The latter part of my career... I couldn't tell you how many Volterol and anti-inflammatories I was taking just to be able to play. It was beyond belief and I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. So, listen, it's done and dusted. But I do believe I should not have come back so quick from that knee injury. And it was West Brom, I remember it was a night game and I played and I just never really got my season going. The next season started quite well. I got Steve Cottrell up front with me and I started well. I remember scoring against Bristol Rovers and I remember scoring... Uh, it might have been the first game of the season actually we won 1-0 I scored in a Coca-Cola Cup League Cup two mm-hmm. goals I got at home and I thought here we go again just getting momentum got another injury and never came back the same player got a lot of stick um, I'd come in in the fans eyes to replace Jimmy Quinn obviously a proven goal scorer I was never going to be the Jimmy Quinn type player I was 19 I played 
you know, twenty odd games for Hartlepool and, and come on as a sub about fifteen times. I was I wasn't even a signed player in the Hartlepool squad. So, but listen, I come in and I think that's what people thought. Effen Effen had left. Effen got the goals. He got his move. Uh, me and Steve Cottrell come in. Cots looked after me. To be fair, um, he sort of took me under his wing a little bit, and he knew I was upset and the stick I was getting. I remember going to and this sticks in my mind and this this meeting we had it. You remember the old um, the old bar in, in the, the club? I forgot what it was called. Oh, yeah, the supporters club, yeah. yeah supporters club, yeah. So we went to yeah. a, an evening with us like, a, like like they do. So it was Tony Pulis, me and Steve Cottrell, and I took an absolute hammering for a couple of supporters. And I was 19. I just turned 20, actually. And um, it was horrible. And they were brutal, a couple of them. Um Cotts stuck up for me. Tony Pulis obviously stuck up for me as the manager. Um, so it would have been my second season. So they were obviously a bit disgruntled about, I suppose, the amount of goals I didn't get. Um, and then I had, on that night, so I can imagine I went home and I was so upset and I phoned my parents and I was like, this is awful. I can't believe I've had to go through that. And it wouldn't happen nowadays because obviously it's all controlled now. But listen, it was was back in the day and it was either sink or swim. It made the man of me. But somebody written me a letter and I got the letter because um, I collected everything. I had piles. Honestly, you wouldn't believe. Wow. I filled this room with all my clippings. I kept everything. Whether I opened a school, I went to a charity, whether we went out for a fun day as a team or everything to do with football, I kept every clipping I could get. And one day I'm going to sit down with my daughters and put them all in scrapbooks. I did start it a few years ago. But anyway, I got this one letter. And he said to me, don't worry about the other night. So obviously this gentleman um, was... Um, in the, in, in the sports club. And he said, all we want, Fletch, is you show determination, desire, passion for the shirt and run around and do everything you can. And I promise you the fans will love you and it will change. And you know what? It stuck with mm. me. So I thought, okay, I'm not getting the goals I want. Mm. So I thought the least I can do is show all my passion, all my desire, all my heart. And it changed my thought process quite a lot. And from that day, you know, I think... My bond with the supporters, obviously, it still was a bit mad. My yeah. people had with me. I mean, I got that, but you know, I think they could see that I did care and I did want to play for Bournemouth, and I was giving everything, whether I scored or I didn't score. I was setting up. I was running back in my own box. I was defending. I was being a proper team player, and obviously, the next season when the Machin come in, I got I got player of the season, and from then I think that was the that was the year ninety four ninety five when we had the first yeah. great escape. That, that Great bond days. and that love, that love uh, with me and their supporters um, sort of got going, really. Yeah, so, Tom, what were your first memories of being a Bournemouth fan? Because you were, you were, what, 1990, yeah. were you? I was 91, so, uh, 91. yeah, I was one years old when uh, when uh, Fletch got uh, down. So, um, wow. I was, yeah, so I was, I was going to ask Fletch, actually, what were the... Because, obviously, I know Tony Poulos as a manager more kind of recently... Um, obviously, when he's saved clubs in the Premier League and that kind of direct approach that he always gets, you know, kind of thrown at him. What were the? What was he like? As how would you describe him as a manager? And what were the differences with kind of him and when Mel Machin come in? What were the kind of clear differences? And how was he with you? And how was he as a gaffer? It was good with me um, because obviously he signed me, so you know you do find that, especially back in the day when a manager signed you. He, He'll give you more time. And he always said to the supporters, he said he will be a good player for this football club. He's not going to be one that might hit the ground running, but he will repair this football club. And hopefully I have over the years, you know, on and off the field, I, I would like to think so. I've given my whole life to the club and it's a club I absolutely adore. So Tony was good. Um, he was, listen, he's a disciplinarian. He 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 had his way, you know, he, he was very fit himself. So we'd go for runs and, you know, we'd be in the New Forest pre-season doing 12, 13 mile runs and, you know, he liked his pattern play. Um, he played a certain way. Um, I don't remember, Tony, Tony, well, he was relieved of his duties after two years, but club had no money and he, he brought a few players on and they were sold for big money and I don't know what the price was back in the day, but, I mean, you know, like Neil Masters went for 400,000, um, Joe Parkinson was 800,000 and Paul yeah. Wood and... I think he'd made the club two million pounds. Now you think twenty-eight years ago, two That's million a lot, pounds. Yeah, a lot of money for a club like Bournemouth. Wow! And yeah, but then that had an impact because obviously the team wasn't as strong. So we were, you know, bottom half of the table, probably the bottom, the bottom third. But 
you know, when you're selling your best players, um, we, it's always going to happen to a club because we were selling club. Um, and we were for many, many years after it. Um, so Tony was good to me, but he, he, he was very disciplined. It, it was his way or, or that was it, you were out. Um, and I suppose he's carried that on when he was in the Premier League because he went there and he, he got teams out because he, he, he did what he did. He stuck to his what he knows, what he likes, how he wants his teams to play. Um, training could have been a little bit more relaxed, a bit more five aside, but he wasn't. He wanted to nail down his formation. He wanted to you know, do a lot of shadow play. Um, and that's the way he was. You know, I, I enjoyed it, but um, Mel come in and... Mel was different. Mel was still a disciplinarian. He he mm -hmm. he disciplined us. You know, he used to give me a, a hell of a bollock in a lot of the times, and but he'd put his arm around me on a Monday morning and go, "Son, I, I love you, son. I, mean, who are you doing <laughs> I love you. You know, you know I love you." <laughs> like, no, Mel, but he could be ruthless in the change room. Oh my god, he would sit like this when we'd been beat. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of us would be round in the old change room and thinking, please don't look up at me because whoever he looked up at, he would be like, yeah, <laughs> you son, tell me why. And then he would go off on one. Oh my God. And he'd be thinking, if it's not you, you'd be thinking, thank God for that. And if it's you, you just have to sit there and take an absolute lashing for about five, five minutes. But then on a Monday morning, he'd come to yeah. me with his arm around you. And, but that's the way he was. So similar, but different um yeah. training was a bit more technical based so it was a little bit different to tony tony was always like 10 v 10s or gameplay and like i said shadow play um a lot of stuff without the ball um where mel was more on the ball and we signed people like steve robinson neil young the team was getting a few younger ones um i think alex watson had left then and people like brian mcgory and we got like scott mean through and then steve jones matty holland and all of a sudden the team had become a younger, which obviously with me being the younger one, I felt like I was obviously like the head of the young ones, if you know what yeah. I mean, because I'd been there for like four years and or three years or whatever. So it, it brought it brought a little bit more out in me. Um so yeah, they, they were they were similar but different, Mel and, and Tony. Different styles of play. Yeah. Um but both very disciplined managers and if you weren't on it or you weren't doing it, you were you were told that's the show. I've seen I've seen a lot of versatility from you, Fletch, in the last uh even the last two weeks, because you've done Mel Machin's accent, you did a Brummy one at the end of AFCB TV the other day. Yeah, yeah, you did Gareth O'Connor pretty well. Um, but also, oh, yeah. I've got <laughs> also I've got to say, um, you had to be quite versatile uh, in your early days under Mel Machin as well, because one of the games you were at centre half, weren't you? I played about 15, 14, 15 games in the half. Oh, 15 games <laughs> was it? Yeah. Um, what happened was Mark Morris got injured. Um, he'd done his shoulder. He was out for months. Um, Alex Watson was already injured, so we had no centre halves. Rob Murray went back there. Then I went back there with Michael Mackel Hatton. So he was a centre midfielder playing centre half. I was a striker playing centre half, and it was ju just supposed to be for one game. And I must have done okay. And then we played again, and then I would have a horrendous game. And it went. It seemed to be like that. It seemed to be did okay for one, not so good for another. But I had no education of how to play at the back. It was just literally. You know, just grasp it and get on with it. Um, I remember getting thumped at home 4 0 off York, and I think it was just before Mel took over. Mel was in the stand watching. And uh, I remember Neil Moss passed the ball to me, or Michael McElhatton, and straight to their striker he scored. And I was like, oh my God, this is horrendous. Mel, Mel must be thinking, well, what is going on? And um, Mel kept me at centre half for a couple of games. Then I got injured. Um, like I said, I had a couple of good, a couple of bad. It was obviously a learning process, but I always wanted to go back as a striker. And then he put me up front on. It was either between Christmas and New Year or it was just after New Year. And we beat Swansea at home 3-1 and I scored two. And that just took off. Took took off. And I'm, I think from that game, I'll even be as poignant as saying that game changed my career. Because I scored two goals. We won 3-2. I think A.D. Pennock scored a winner in the last two minutes. I think. Mm. Someone might tell me different, but I'm sure he won. We beat, I'm sure it was Swansea. And... Um, I had a great end to the season and, and one player of the season. And I think yeah. that, that was a defining game for me. I'd come back from just a little injury, two or three weeks out, gathered my thoughts, obviously decided I don't want to go centre-half, spoke to Mel. Mel said, I'm going to put you back up front. Scored two and the rest is history.
Yeah. That first uh, Great Escape season, Fletch, I mean, that was that was some recovery from nine points at Christmas to end, ending the season on 50. And it was five teams went down as well, as I remember. So, you know, it was a, a tough ask. But uh, what are your what are your favourite memories of that, that title running? Obviously, Brentford and Shrewsbury stood out for the fans. But what about you? Yes, it was a crazy, crazy, crazy season. Um, so that was the year I won Player of the Year, wasn't it? Yeah, 1985, yes, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, we started off our end at nine points at Christmas. I mean, we couldn't have been taking any any bets yeah. in the bookies for us going down. It was We were just odds on to go down. I think from Christmas onwards, we'd have been second in the league behind Birmingham on points one, so we'd have got promoted from Christmas. <laughs> And we had to. Yeah, and wow. I think we won a couple of games and it just gave us the momentum. Like I said, we were a young squad and we kept winning and we beat Birmingham at home, I remember. Um, we were flying high, massive club for it to be in you know, League One or was League was Division Three, we won it back then or whatever. Um, it was just a momentum thing. We, we got a bit of belief and at any level, if you have that momentum and a bit of belief and a, and a tight squad who want to do well for each other and it, we just rolled on and rolled on we were like, we got a chance here, and mm. just belief came back in us. And I remember the game at Brentford was the wow, first yeah. time we got out of the relegation, um, and that was a phenomenal game because it was massive pressure. Because we hadn't won it, we'd have gone down. Simple as that. And they were pushing for promotion, I think, or even to to win the league. Yeah. Then yeah, we beat them two one. Scott Mean scored from twenty five yards. Then they equalised for a scrappy goal, and then Steve Jones down the channel, beat his man and smashed it into the near post roof of the net and we won the game and we just got out of the relegation zone because I remember celebrating with our fans down the bottom end of Brentford where they're behind the goal and they were saying we're out of the relegation zone so we knew we had Plymouth to play at home and it was in our destiny for the first time in 45 games. It was going down the first time we'd ever got out of the relegation. It was in our own destiny. And it was crazy because we played on a Tuesday night, I believe. It was. And yet all the other yeah. games, or Tuesday or Wednesday and all the other games on the Saturday and it was because of what happened down here the year before I got here to do with Leeds and being a bank holiday yeah. or something 1990 yeah so it was I mean it wouldn't happen now because obviously all the games are played on the last day and they have to be played simultaneously but now going back we we knew our own destiny if we beat Plymouth on the Tuesday it doesn't matter what happens because we had, that's our last game and the game was done and dusted in 20 minutes I think it was Steve yeah. yeah Scott Mean scored Steve Robinson scored did Jason Brissett score? Did Rob Wolf yeah, get to yeah. yeah, someone scored twice. I think. I think yeah, Rob scored, scored twice in that one. Twice, yeah. Scott Mean got the other one, and by half time we were three and a up. Now in the change room, you can imagine we just panic set in because you're just thinking, just to hold out, please, twenty minutes. And we romped the game really. I know we didn't score another goal, but we absolutely tore them apart. And I remember, no, it wasn't Plymouth. What am I on about? Shrewsbury. It was Shrewsbury. Yeah, because I'll tell you why I've got Plymouth, because it was Plymouth fans in our standard come down to watch the game with Plymouth. Yeah, in their green and black shirts, yeah. Yeah, because they wanted to obviously see us get beat and they were in <laughs> the main, what was the old main stand yeah. and they were down the front row and I'm thinking Shrewsbury don't play in green and white and I was looked and there was Plymouth fans there because it was between us and Plymouth and because um, we won the game, obviously Plymouth went down. Yeah, but yeah obviously it was Shrewsbury and uh, we tortured Shrewsbury that night and the pitch invasion, I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. And mm. that was the first big moment of my career and one that sticks with me now. And it's, it's a one that people still talk about to this day. Yeah, you said it made your career in many ways, that great escape. I mean, I expect it, it yeah. kind of moulds you psychologically as well, doesn't it? Because that's quite a, a situation to be only nine points at Christmas and then turn it around to that extent, especially when there's five teams going down. Yes, it did. It made a man of me and not just me. I think the team grew up. Um, I think all the young lads, we, we grew up and become men that day or that season. Uh, because you're right, nine points at Christmas. You should be done and dusted by yeah. February. See you later. But just shows what good team spirit, the manager, you know, the, the belief and togetherness and hard work and determination can bring out because we had no, no divine right to even get out of it. It was should have been all done, like I say, February, March. And we went on this run and... You know, we had influential players. We had our captain, Mark Morris, and I remember Eddie Pennick getting some important calls. We had we had some good characters in that in that changing room. Um, we had to have, otherwise we'd never done what we did. Did you did you ever feel like, um, you know, since 92 when you joined, we were a club that was pretty much treading water and even off the pitch then 
we were sort of winding forward to 97 um, with the threat of extinction. Um, and we spoke to Matt Holland actually on this podcast uh, a couple of months ago. And we said, you know, most players wanted to, well, all players wanted to carry on, you know, despite not even being paid. Um, I expect what's ha- you know, what happened on the pitch also perhaps aids your decision off the pitch in terms of deciding to carry on. Can, you know, did any players not show the same metal and think, oh, actually, I no. don't want to be part of this if we're not getting no, paid? No, not one of us. We all dug in. I think it's because we've been through a hell of a lot. Um, we've got other players in there, obviously, like Ian Cox come down and maybe people like John O'Neill. Oh, God, I'm trying to remember back. But we never once contemplated. I know we played like six weeks without getting paid and we thought we beat Bristol City. We were flying high 1-0 away from home and Ian Cox got the goal from a corner. A little flick yeah. header at the near post. And we thought that could have been our last game. Uh, we thought Bournemouth will go and see you later. Um, but it never entered our minds to not play. It's like, what I dreamed of doing all my life. Why were I not going to want to be a professional football? Of course, getting paid. Obviously, we went on a lot of money, and I remember having to put all my you know, finances aside and just scrape together what I had. My parents obviously helped me out, helped me out a lot. Um, my wife was pregnant. We were trying to get a mortgage. Couldn't get a mortgage because the club, you know, wasn't. We didn't know whether well the mortgage people said don't whether the club's going to be here or not so they can't give me a mortgage if I don't have a job and I'm like well I'll probably get another football club and they're like probably is not good enough so luckily the club got saved I literally the date got saved I had the forms for um what's his name uh, our old chairman and what we said the club Trevor Watkins Trevor Watkins yeah 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 and I had him I had the form my mortgage form for him to sign so I got to get it in the next day I had about two days otherwise I was going to lose that house that me and my wife were going to buy a little two bedroom in Throop and uh, yeah. she was heavily pregnant with my, my first daughter and yes we thought we honestly thought that the club was going to go um, but no the players the players never once and that's on my hand on my heart the players not once had contemplated not playing for the football club and obviously we had the winter gardens and everything I think yeah when you see that from your own fans, that togetherness, you would have to be some heartless person to not want to play for the club when you've just been in the Winter Gardens. You'd have to spend one night in the Winter Gardens and you would you just felt that bond and the and the the willingness for the for the fans in the town to see that football club carry on. So Yeah. And and things were different then, you know, there wasn't a lot of money in it, so we're not talking millions of pounds for our players, you're talking hundreds of pounds, but it was we just wanted to play for Bournemouth Football Club. We've been through a hell of a lot. We've seen the club obviously go into the financial difficulties, and we were doing everything we could, um, along with the fans and the supporters, to make sure that club survived. So, no, we didn't ever contemplate it once not playing. Yeah, Tom, after the uh, sort of financial issues, obviously, you were at a very young age, but you know, you went to Wembley, didn't you? And it, it you know, as a fan, it felt like the, the perfect sort of you know, tonic after you know, the financial yep. way to see it sort of culminating on the pitch. What were your remembrances of that day, Tom? Yeah, I was saying, it's kind of, it's weird talking about the Winter Gardens and stuff there. That's probably like one of my first memories as a Bournemouth fan is that, not even a game. It's mm. that I started support, started getting into football. I was probably, you know, what, six years old, something like that. Start supporting my local team and I'm just hearing that we might not be a team. It was, um, it was bizarre. I do remember that. And then I'd, yeah, it was kind of, it was that season that I, I started going and then obviously we got to Wembley. So it was really weird because I, I thought I've started supporting this team and my local team that haven't got any money and I don't even know if I'm going to see them for a season. And then by the end of it, I was going to Wembley. It was um, it was quite weird, but I remember that day well. It was a amazing occasion, but um, definitely probably the first time I can remember as a fan crying. So I've got um, yeah, I've all the, I've all the face paint on, all stuff like that. I remember that well. But um, yeah, I think it's it shows if you went down all the years as a Bournemouth fan. I think Fletcher would probably agree. All these times of you know, kind of maybe going into liquidation to even being in the Premier League and being the little team that no one expects. We're always fighting against mm. adversity. And that seems to, especially when you've got a young group of players, just bring everyone together. And it just seems like we just keep doing that nonstop. And it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing to hear that even all the way back then, we're still kind of fighting against everyone and defying the odds. It's great. Yeah, no, I, uh, you know, I completely agree. And, you know, shame about the result that day. Um, yeah. Who ever thought the golden goal? Rather shot, sure. but uh, yeah, not good. Te- Fletcher, um, you, as I said earlier, you sort of seem to have the same emotions as we do as fans. So on the night before Wembley, did you sleep well? 
Um, no, I don't sleep well. I never sleep well all my life. <laughs> if I get four hours, five hours in a night, I'm absolutely buzzing. That's even now. So, no, I remember the game. Um, it was amazing, obviously, to go to Wembley as a boyhood dream. The one mm. thing I wanted to do, well, two things, play for Liverpool Football Club, my favourite club, and, and walk out of Wembley. Well, obviously, did one of them. I know it wasn't in an FA Cup final, but for me, it was not It was my FA Cup final, or the club's yeah. FA Cup final. So, going to Wembley was amazing. Um never really thought about the golden goal thing till it happened and it was horrendous when it happened because it just ends and it was it was ridiculous they even brought it in but anyway we had to deal with it I think it was in they brought it into the European Championships that year as well didn't it um, yeah but anyway we, yeah I mean to see all them people go down I think we took 33 34,000 supporters I mean 67,000 in Wembley it was amazing all my family were down and to walk out I was proud as punch but the night before in the hotel Obviously, we stayed in a big plush hotel. We're not used to that. And um, I just remember, like, just waking up all the time, just the adrenaline just running through my body. So, like, my doggy just come and see Yeah, me. no worries. <laughs> I had to open the door. It's a bit hot in so much yeah. summer house. So, it's like, um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm trying to remember back, was it 98, wasn't it? I, I was actually, it was my most fruitful season of scoring. I scored 14 goals. Um, I was very confident I was going to score in the final, and I did have a chance with a header quite late in the game um, and it just went wide um, playing up against a big centre half I think he's about six foot six and I got above him but that was my moment I didn't really have many other chances after that I know I played a little part in the goal where I flicked it onto Steeny and then John Bailey prodded it in um, and we watched the game back because I still sit with Eddie and Jason and in the office and sometimes we put the game on and we just and especially Jimmy Glass in goal, we, we just slaughter him all the time. He was the first goalkeeper, <laughs> the best goalkeeper in history to score in a Wembley final. Yeah. He, volleyed it, he volleyed it into the roof of the net for the equaliser. <laughs> yeah. And then we batter ready because it was a mix up between him, Coxie, and Jimmy Glass that led to the corner from the goal. And um, Wayne Burnett obviously sidestepped Steve Robinson, and Jimmy was in no man's land like he usually was. And, <laughs> We lost the yeah. two one, and we were devastated because you know to play in a big final you want to win. The only thing I will say was when you play in a cup final like that, yeah, it's totally different to playing in a final like the the one in two thousand and three at Millennium Stadium because your whole season depends on that game. Where yeah. the cup final, yes, you had a good cup run, but at the end of the day, your yeah, league status is still in place. So it was it was destroying, soul destroying. But I got over it more than probably I would if we'd got beat say off Lincoln in two thousand and three at the Millennium Stadium. But it was a massive achievement. I know the club made a lot of money. They even took us away for 10 days, first time ever. Uh, Post-season tour, we went to America. We went to Milwaukee and Chicago. Um, I think the club made, from that cup run, I think they made something like three quarters of a million pounds, which is incredible for a club like us. Um, and great times, like I say, it was a boyhood dream to walk out of Wembley. Just unfortunate. I was a loser, but there wasn't much in the day, I think. Grimsby were good that year. They actually went back in the playoff final yeah. and won again. Mm -hmm. So they had two victories in the space of a couple of months. Um, but yeah, like I said, I was 98, so I was 20, 25, coming up 26. Um, mm -hmm. and it was a, one of them I ticked the box off, played at Wembley, and no one can ever take that away from me in front of nearly 70,000 people. So it was amazing. So by that time, Fletch, you're already playing with Eddie in the team. What what did you make of him when he first came into the side? Because uh, you were he was 18 when he made his debut, wasn't he? So did you did you think yeah. oh, he's, who's this young upstart, or did you always think he was carved out for greatness? No, I've got to be careful what I say as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, we speak about it. I looked after Eddie, and listen, he ended up being my roommate after a couple of years. And he was my roomie for many years. Um, six and a half, is he five and a half? Five and a half years younger than me. So I watched him come through the youth. Um, he got released as a youth team player and then he got asked back by Mel Machen um, because someone got injured and that's how fate has it, you know, otherwise he'd have gone off and maybe not become a professional footballer anywhere else himself. So um, he got asked back. He had a really good game. They offered him a first year professional contract. I remember him coming in, he was quite obviously shy, quiet, timid a little bit and obviously you've got a few of us there have been here many years and obviously I was one of the loudest and got people like Neil Young and Robbo and John Bailey, oh John Bailey, wow he could be ruthless, great yeah. lad but wow he could be ruthless to the young lad so it, Eddie would say Eddie would say now if he was here it was, it was quite a harsh beginning for him yeah. um, 
But I always got on really well. And I, I looked at him and he, he started off as a right back and then he went to centre half with Coxie and they struck up one of the best partnerships in the league. And now we never got promoted with that team with Jamie Vincent, you know, and the team we had. We, it, was, it was a travesty, really, looking back. That team should have went on and easily got promoted in the years that we had together. Um, but I could see an old head on young shoulders and Eddie was, you know, when we had nights out, he, he didn't really come out. He, he was so disciplined and he was like sort of the start of the new breed. It was, he was still one of the lads, of course he was, he was right in the mix and you know, we always called the, the, the likely lads rows at the back of the coach on away trips because we wouldn't allow or I wouldn't allow anyone past mm. the last third of the bus unless they'd been there a while and they deserved the right to get to the back of the, back of the bus because that's where all the banter was. So yeah, yeah. We, ever, we ever had a new lad come to the back of the bus, I'd be like... What are you doing? Get down the front. You and get up here until you've the right. You just get down. You know, it's like, but Ed was Ed was always in a moment, but he was always the disciplined one. He was always the one who was doing extras. You know, I wish I'd done it. Listen, I, I have a million regrets. I wish I'd done it with him. You know, he was always the one out on the outside the stadium, working on his left foot, working on his left foot because he played left side centre half, but he was right footed. So he used to clip the ball into me, and he was always just practicing them little balls into me and paid dividends for him, you know, if it wasn't for his injuries, he'd have been a, you know, a good championship player or a second level, second tier player. Yeah. And who knows, he might even went to the top because he was in the England and the 21 side, which obviously reminds me, Perchie, JT and Neil Moss about nearly every day. But um, yeah, he was a top player. He, he, had to, he had to wear his heart on his sleeve because with him only being, he says he's six foot, he's not six foot, he's five <laughs> eleven. <laughs> five. Uh, not six foot, I love it. but he could ju- he could jump well and he timed it well and he had to be brave. And I remember I used to call him last year Jeffy because he would throw his head in where it hurts. Nobody else wanted to put the head. Yeah. A bit like myself, he he had no fear of heading the ball and he used to time it well because obviously he was a lot smaller than most of the strikers and he won so many headers that he shouldn't have won for for his size because he was brave. He timed it well and just worked on his game. Um, yeah. He deserved a longer career for for the effort he put in and the desire he he showed. Um, like I say, he was a type of a new breed. It was like he didn't he wasn't a follower. He didn't do all because they do it. We'll go out, we'll go to the pub and have a drink because they are or yeah. we'll go out we'll go out and do this because he said no 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 I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to sit in and I'm going to relax and I'm going to prepare and I was like I could just see an old head on young shoulders and obviously. <laughs> We've seen that now with his management. I mean, he's still only, was he 42? But you know, he started when he was, what, 30, 31? It's just incredible. So nobody can foresee the future, obviously, or, or what he would have achieved, especially as a manager. But I could definitely, as a player, I've seen something special that I hadn't seen at Bournemouth in the previous four or five years I've been there. Does he, does he really let himself go now much, or do you not see much of that? No. <laughs> that face he, it so there's too many... We have two relationships, me and Ed. We have our working relationship and we have our out of work relationship. So, and we speak to each other different in that environment. So, when I'm around the club, even it was just me and him on the pitch the other day, we were setting up a training session. He'd written a session. I was carrying all the equipment, getting it set up for him. And even though there was just me and him, I still referred to him as gaffer boss. But when it's just say me and him and we're out of the football environment, I might call him Eddie, you know, if, if I see him out or. We spend time outside of the, of the stadium, but in the stadium, even though it was just me and him, I still called him boss. And I was running around, I put something in the wrong place, and he looked at me and gave me that look. I was like, Oh, wow, he's on it today. And <laughs> yeah, and, but we have that relationship, it's basically a professional relationship in the stadium and around the football environment every time we're in, 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 in that area. And then when we're together out, you know, we relax or I relax a bit more, and we have a bit of banter, and we talk about the old times. and but no, he doesn't. What he does, he let himself go. No. <laughs> yes, he does, but not really. No, he can't now. It's totally different. He can't. He can't breathe these no. days without somebody saying something about you. You know, just because of the position we're in in the Premier League, and I don't think even now he realizes how worldwide he's known. We go yeah. places out the country when we go preseason. You know, on tour preseason, and people from other countries. Went up and he gets noticed whether you're in America when we went or we're in, we went over to Spain to Real Madrid to train and people are coming up the, the people local people from the country and you just look at them and go Eddie Howe 
And I'm like, wow, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> that's <laughs> bizarre, isn't it? Um, I was about to say, with um, with regards to Wembley, before we, because we'll fast forward quite quickly on to 2003, but in terms of that Wembley, I mean, there's a lot of players on the pitch there that are still involved today uh, or were involved over the years. I mean, you know, Paul Groves, we won't talk much about that, but also Jimmy Glass as well. Um, Jimmy Glass, yeah. you, you sort of alluded to the fact that he, he was an unconventional goalkeeper, but do you remember that? match it was live on sky fa cup against bristol city you scored the winner john o'neill scored scored a worldie to make it 2-1 but jimmy glass was on fire that day do you remember that yes because it's the one and only jim jimmy was on fire <laughs> oh <laughs> that is, that is <laughs> ruthless it was uh it was live on sky we won 3-1 yeah i scored the third goal john o'neill scored a screamer from 25 30 yards into the top corner yeah. Colin, God, he's my memory. Colin Cram got one of the goals back for Bristol City. Yeah, that's right. And two, two nil, two one. Then I scored to make it three one. I stabbed it in the keeper, um, dived early, and I saw just got it under my feet and scooped it into the roof of the net. And it was a great game. We all played really well. And uh, yeah. Jimmy was on flames. He got man of the match. And um, we watched it back. He just reminded us of that game. He was, and but he was, he was a bit unconventional. But Jimmy, and obviously works at the club now. He's player liaison. Um, and I've known him ever since he stayed down here so even though he moved around the country and he had something like 17 clubs or 15 clubs in his career it was crazy uh, he always lived in Wimborne kept his place so I always seen him even when he wasn't at the club for many many years um, I always kept in touch with Jimmy and he is he listen he, he wears his heart on his, his sleeve he's quite an emotional character he, he's like me he's a Leo so when we're arguing about a, a a topic no one wants to give in in the end of just walking away go whatever Jimmy can be brother maybe do me nothing he, he won't get he won't back down he's always right and he's like no this is it big and I'm telling you this is it and I'm like Jimmy <laughs> Jimmy calm calm down and he won't and, it, and we were like that as players we used to wind each other up and to a point where anyone listening would have thought they don't like each other I did I, I got on really well with Jimmy I get on, on much better with him now I just thought he was when he was a player he was he was tough to tough to talk to so you talk about something and he'd fly off the handle and and I was like oh Jimmy I'm, I'm not talking to you about it um, but listen he, he was a maverick he had some unbelievable games and does things that keepers couldn't do at that level and then sometimes you think Jimmy well listen everyone can you know flitter in and out of the form but Jimmy was one good game one bad game one, and he'll tell you that and he's honest you know he but listen he started off at Crystal Palace you know he was he played a few games with them he, he must he was, a, he was a good keeper I just his relationship with Mel Machen wasn't unbelievable. Jimmy, like I say, flew off the handle and obviously Mel didn't like it a lot. And I'm not saying that's the reason he left, but I just think Jimmy needed to have somewhere to settle down and, and be there for a while. And I think going from club to club to club, if you look, and, and Jimmy a lot, obviously, I, mean, I don't know how many appearances he made, maybe a couple of hundred, maybe a few, a few more, but for a 15-year career, whatever he had, he should have, he should have made more. Um, does he have regrets? Yeah, that's probably he probably doesn't. We all do. Um, yeah. Listen, he's, he, Jimmy has now become one of my best friends. Um, just you know what it's like, stri strikers and keepers, they, they don't get on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, 2003. 2003. I mean, what a playoff final that was. Uh, uh, seeing that goal at the start again, it brought tears to my eyes again, as it did on the day. It was a fantastic game. And uh, what what do you remember about that that playoff series because you, you came through against it was Barry wasn't it that you beat in that sort of first round and then to Lincoln who beaten us what only a few weeks earlier hadn't they yeah the beat us 1-0 but we played really well I mean it was one of them games if you took the goal out of it and said what do you think the score was in this game we've taken the goals out you'd probably say 4-5-0 to Bournemouth so coming off it was a it was a mixed feeling because even though we got beat one of the other teams must have got beat because we were cemented in the playoffs so we got beat, but we were still guaranteed playoffs. And then we knew we were playing Lincoln. So we thought, right, we can beat these on a big pitch. We can pass them off the park. Now, we know they're a big side. We just got to you know, manage their aerial threat and long throws and free kicks. Um, so I was very confident if, obviously, we got to play Lincoln. Um, we had to beat Bury first. We went up there and a drab nil-niller. But that was, I was happy with that. I took that all day long. And then we beat them 3-1 at home comfortably. I remember Weird Elliot being on fire in that second game and James Hayter. Um, when we got Lincoln in the final, 
I was so determined not to be on the losing side again. Yeah. Not just because of the final, but the t- so many times we've missed out on promotion on the last day or getting in the playoffs. So it was like, you know, the wrecks and the nil-nil at home. It's like so many times I thought, we, I'm sick of being not, not a winner. I want something. I want to win something. Um, you know, I hadn't really won. I, I got promotion with Hartlepool, but I hadn't really won anything and it was a big occasion because like I said it was different to Wembley your whole your whole season depended on this game and I was so pumped up um, we stayed at a big posh hotel which Carl Fletcher alluded to I think it was called the Vale of Glamorgan um, we were in the away changing room so that played on my mind because I am quite superstitious oh, yeah, that's apparently right. the away changing, room, away changing room had a history of losers but I was that made me probably more determined to say no chance I remember in the tunnel I just walked out I took this deep breath and it's actually on Sky because the camera followed from the back of the lineup and I was always last out and I remember yeah, the tight yeah, sure. and I breathed in and the camera was there and I was like, right, I'm up for this. I was putting up against Ben Foot, who was six foot mm-hmm. seven. So I knew I had to be on my game because obviously he's a big physical presence. Um, and when I shook the hands of the, the people along the line, I mean, he broke his hand. I was just ready to explore. <laughs> I, was, I remember uh, Carl Fletcher said we didn't start well, but I thought, I thought we did, and I watched it back, and he is right. We didn't really mm. play well first half. But I thought I did okay doing what I did, which was winning my headers, going back in defence, winning my headers above Ben Futcher. Obviously, I know he scored. I blame Mossy because Mossy shouted keepers, and I sort of got jammed between them, and I get the blame, but it was really Neil Moss um, when Ben Futcher scored. But apart from that one header, I dominated, and I was I was really happy going in at half time, obviously scoring, but I was I thought my game was quite well. Um, I... I implemented it really well um, what I thought in my brain I was processing it the night before what I'm going to do against him I'm going to set my stall out early I'm going to win my headers um, and I thought I did that and I thought looking back now we played really well second half getting the goal was amazing I mean to run to my family and score in a final but it was so early on I knew it wasn't going to be the only goal and you wanted to be the winner and I'm not being selfish but I'd love it to be 1-0 and I scored mm. goal 100% but Five two, an amazing day, and um, I just didn't want to be. I just didn't want to be a loser, and I was so determined to to give everything. I thought if there's one time now, I've got to play my heart out and give everything. And that that bloke writing that letter from me years ago, I talked about the dream, yeah. I'm sure. You um, that was you said on my mind. I'm like I'm just going to do this, and I'm going to give the fans all I have. Hmm. Yeah, you said that you were. Uh... Oh, sorry. You said that you were really pumped ahead of that, and um. Sometimes that can have a negative effect. You remember Joe Hart in the uh, what was it the Euros, and he was really pumped against Iceland, and then he had a shocker, and like we ended up two one. Mm. But you know, you've always used that you, you sort of emotion yeah. in a positive way, by the looks of it. Yes, I know. I wish I'd done it another five or six hundred times. In my career. <laughs> That's true, though. I know I'm joking, but it's true. I, I should have had that determination, desire a hell of a lot more than what I did, and. People always said you always turn up at the big games, Fletch, and it's mm. something they probably said tongue in cheek. And in my own mind, I'm thinking, you know what, he's right. Yeah, all right. I should have turned up for the games where, all right, it wasn't a massive game, as in it was a season defining game or whatever, or a final, but it was the basis of what my career was about. And I didn't turn up enough times, but I was the one I could. It just proves that it, it, the mental side of it, because. If I could mentally tune myself in and think, and I'm not going to get beat today, there's no chance my man's going to overpower me, I'm going to dominate him. And when I thought about them games, I did, and I went mm. and delivered. So now that that plays on my mind, right, because my career, I can never get back, like every player will tell you, and I know I played 830-odd games, but I should have, I should have, should have had that more times, and it plays on my mind, what if, what if, what if. And I wouldn't change a lot of it, because I had a fabulous career, um, but I would change my thought process going into games. I think I should have had that that determination, that right, at no cost is my man going to out-dominate me today. And um, I just remember, like I say, on the day, and, and I used to use that to my advantage, because when I told myself that, practically every time, you know, I, I came to the fore and I, I, I did dominate. Uh, like you say, some people are too pumped and it affects the game. For me, it was the other way around. When I was too relaxed, I didn't play well. Tom, um, if you were going to uh, vote on your favourite goal technique between Cardiff and Grimsby, what would you go for, mate? Oh, 
So I'll, I'll, I'll probably on goal technique, I think it's got to be the one at Cardiff, actually. I think that's, like you said, it was on the other day. Obviously, Bournemouth played it back. And uh, I think I was about 12 when I went. Um, so hard to appreciate, you know, kind of the performance and stuff like that. But that goal was, I think, technically, I think it was better than the Grimsby goal. I think that was a really hard half volley. At a, your leg was definitely higher than me. I mean, I'm 5'6", so that was, your leg was higher than 5'6", <laughs> I'm telling you. But um, yeah, that, that one probably edges it for me. But um yeah, I, I agree with with what Fletch said about that game. Probably started a little bit slowly, but we they were a good side, Lincoln, but they were very direct. And you could see in that game that we were the footballing team. And there was a few performances there, like I say, watching the other the other day when it was on. And Marcus Browning ran the game. I thought you and James Hayter didn't stop all game. And it was yeah. there was some really good performance there. Warren Cummings just down that left all, and didn't appreciate how if you look at the players individually as well, you think that, that team was too good to be in that league. And it was we were deservedly went up that season. But yeah, I'd onto the goal, I would say I prefer the Grimsby goal for obvious reasons. But um yeah, that was a better technical goal for me. Did you agree, Fletch? Yeah, and it's ironic, isn't it? Obviously, majority of my goals I think I scored 136. And somebody said a stat like I scored 80 with my head and the rest with my feet. Which actually I thought I scored more with my head, but I didn't. <laughs> but the two goals, the most important goals in my career, the two were both volleys. Um <laughs> It's like I wasn't really renowned for my volume, but the two the two goals, the, the Grimsby goal and the, and the Cardiff goal were both, both always my right foot. I always right. say you're... The Cardiff, the Cardiff one, I had to come across Ben Fudger, I had a gamble mm. and I had to hit it technically really well because it was on the rise and I hit it on the volley and it was probably a half volley as such to keep the ball down. But the Grimsby one, I chested it up in the air and I had time to twist my body and then make good contact and that one I obviously just hit it as hard as I could and you know I think I, I was always going to hit the target against Grimsby because mm. if I'd have missed the target from 12 yards with a volley I'd have been absolutely devastated where looking back the, the, the Cardiff one I suppose could have went in the stand really but I did well to keep it down I think very unlike me. <laughs> I think ben, ben makes a really good point on the chat Fletch you know all that time watching Mark Hughes. Mm. Yeah you're right. <laughs> No, you're right, because he was, he was an I talked about his hold-up playing and backing into defenders and how he used to use his backside and his strength to protect the ball, but he was also an incredible volume of the football. Um, you know, the, we've had someone very much like that who you had on your, or was having on your show, Jan Kermigan, what a volume he was. His technique, I was nowhere near the, the capabilities and technique of Jan. But we used to do, and, it, and once again, I used to practice volleys, and even in training, we used to do... A little training session where it was like you flick it up, you chest it, you volley it, um, and then if you score, you, you go through the next round. And did that when I was younger as well. And it all comes back, you know, to the to the techniques, the the ground, you know, the, the, all your all your stuff from school. You know, you when you're in the playground and you take it down in your chest and you volley it and hit the target. And subconsciously, you, you don't think about that when the ball lands to you, but mm. it all goes back to. To what you've done as a kid, and if you look at them two volleys, that was what I used to practice. And um, like I say, but Jan Kermigan is a fantastic technician at volleying. But you're right, Mark Hughes. Wow, I've seen him score some unbelievable volleys. We've um, we've got a person watching tonight. A certain person who took over your role as co-commentator with Chris Temple on Radio Solent. Willow's watching tonight, and Viv See? has. Uh, yeah, he is, and Viv has uh, submitted a. A message on chat saying uh, Willow wants to know <laughs> yeah. uh, Willow wants to know why Big Head never tells the Seattle story what's no Big Head never tells the Seattle story <laughs> yeah Seattle. can it be told <laughs> no no stories there <laughs> <laughs> can you give us a taster no 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 it was a pre-season thing can't sorry yeah. okay <laughs> all right uh, what an idiot. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we'll have to park that one. But... Good... Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on, Jeff. <laughs> no, I, was just no, I know I was going to let Fletch Will finish. Top... <laughs> Willow was top bloke. He, for the time we had him as assistant manager, he was, he was brilliant. And, you know, he would just take me off. We never really got much indiv individual training back in the day, but he would take me off and just practice on my side foot finishes, little volleys into the net. Um he, he was great for the players because we had Mel and then obviously it was sometimes tough to talk to Mel and like we spoke about, he was 
disciplined and he had his way. But then Willow, you know, you could go and speak to Willow about certain things and then he would speak to Mel and smooth it all over. And he, he complimented Mel really well. Um, really enjoyed my time with Willow and been friends ever since and still communicate. He's top bloke. Did Seattle involve anything to do with darts, Fletch? Sorry? Did Seattle involve anything to do with darts? <laughs> yeah, it did. We were... It was a yeah, it was a pre-season game, and I was yeah, I was on fire. <laughs> I, my my mum and dad, my mum and dad owned a pub, and um, obviously pool darts was big because it was a workman's pub. So from a young age, five or six, I was always on the pool table. I was always throwing darts. We we got a dart board in the football club at the moment in the mm -hmm. players' pavilion, and um, Pewie's about the only person who come close to me. But yeah, I'm good at darts. Um, I'm not unbelievable. I don't practice, but I'm I've, from a young age. Just played and yeah, we were in a bar. That's all I'm saying. We were in a bar and I was playing darts and can't really speak about much more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. So sorry, yeah. Sorry. So going on to um, what happened on the pitch, of course. Um, you know, we'll we'll kind of rattle through Fletch because we realise that we've not even sort of got onto Grimsby yet. But so we'll try to get onto that as as soon as possible. Plus, you know, the team these days. Um, of course, you were released or you went, either by choice or, you know, whatever. Can you just talk about leaving the club at the end of the 2006-2007 season and, and what were the reasons behind your departure? Um, well, <laughs> it was so I just wasn't, didn't have me in his plans, Kevin Bond, you know, as simple as that. Um, went into the office Monday morning. We all had slots, 9, 9.30, 10, 10.30, blah, blah, blah. And I went in and I sat down. Within five minutes, I'd left the office and just said, I'm sorry, Fletch, it's, you know, these things happen. I was 30, 34, nearly 35, so it was 34, yeah. Um, I thought I thought I'd have got another year. Sam Vox was coming through and I was like, well, I can help Sam, but, you know, Kevin wanted to go on a different path and that's, you know, that's obviously up to him. And looking back, I was, I mean, I was absolutely devastated. I got home and I was in floods of tears. And the fans set up some tribute on one of the sites and I had over 750 messages and my mum and my dad phoned me up and my wife and said, have you seen this site they've set up and all these what messages thanking me for, that was crazy. I've, I printed every single one off individually wow. and kept them in a big folder. And they were like, they were, look, most of it wasn't to do with football. It was like, you were my inspiration when my daughter had a, a, a car accident and you, you were inspiration pulling and it, it just it just I was gone I was like wow I never think about it you go to hospitals you go to charities you go I went to people's houses but I just do it because that's the way I was brought up and I wanted to do it and I was schooled in the right way as, from my parents and but then all these messages come back reminding me of all the things I've done and I think about 70% of them were things outside of the football pitch rather than on it and I was like wow I remember that and remember that and I was thinking I'm so proud um, of the things I'd done, but obviously it was very upsetting and didn't have a club. I was nearly 35. Um, I thought I was going to get another year, so I went into the office with Kevin, expecting maybe a year and come out absolutely devastated. But luckily, within 48 hours, I'd had calls left, right, and centre, so I thought, well, I have got options. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was hard because it was 15 years and I just thought it was never going to end. But looking back, God's honest truth, it was the best thing that ever happened because when I came back, it changed me, my mentality, every game I played then on, and obviously the great escape, yeah. 2009, I played every game I could play. And it was because of Eddie as well, of course, if it was any other manager, it might not have been the same, but I just thought I'm going to play every single game like it's my last. Like, like the card Like you game. said, yeah. 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 And Tom. I know I was 36, but 36 when I come back, it was way too late to... to push for my career but I thought I'm not going to let this lie I've, I've wasted too much time and I'll never have any more regrets so looking back yes I was devastated but 18 months away was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was just a different person on and off the pitch when I came back at the age of 36. Yeah Tom we was uh, we talking with Brett on on Tuesday about you know when certain players leave you always tend to follow their career and Fletch was another one and you know I was absolutely devastated I don't know about you Tom. Yeah, yeah, I, was, I, I found it really, you know, obviously I don't, Kevin Bond, I'm sure he's a good coach, good manager, and it, it seemed bizarre to me at the time, thinking that a manager that, I, I wouldn't say he was, he wasn't like disliked by fans, but he was still trying to, you know, win the fans over, and 
to get rid of, you know, a club legend, it did seem a really bizarre move to, like you say, I, I just assumed Fletcher would get another year, you know, at, at Fletcher's age, you you know, he's probably only going to get another year, but I just felt like it would keep rolling until, you know, Fletcher decides to hang his boots up. So it was bizarre. It was really strange. I felt like from whenever, as soon as, well, like we just alluded to, when I was born, Fletcher played for Bournemouth. So it was, um, it was bizarre. And um, like we said, when we spoke to, spoke to Brett, there's, there's not many that, when you leave, it seems like every Bournemouth fan's in a bit of shock. And it was um, a really weird one. I remember a few, God knows how many years later, going to a Bournemouth game away at Chesterfield, who was obviously the first club uh, Fletch went to. And all I wanted to do was I went into, it was like a social club um, at Chesterfield away. And I said, oh, you, what was Fletch like when he was here? I just wanted to know. And to be fair, Fletch, they all, the Chesterfield fans were, it was when you would come back. Um, I can't remember, they changed their stadium, so I can't remember what stadium it was. But I remember them all, it, yeah, something like, like Saltgate, yeah. And I remember all the Chesterfield fans saying, "Oh, you've got big Fletch back, haven't you? Oh, we loved him here, you know." And it was really nice to hear that kind of all these other fans seem to have the same sort of memories, even in the short time that you were there. How did you get on at Chesterfield? Because you weren't there for that long, Fletch. How did you? How did you find it there? Well, I loved the club. Um, I said when I left, I had two years. I had a year with the air option, but it was my option, but I decided yeah. not to take it because I needed to get back closer to my family. And they give me loads of time off. Lee Richardson was the manager. And, you know, if we if we got a result on a Saturday, I'd go back on a Wednesday. I got a few days. Obviously, I'd do training myself on a Monday and Tuesday. But he was very, very good towards me. He understood my age and he just wanted me to play. I had a great rapport with their fans. I think because I made time and effort with them and I spoke to them and I would always, before the game, chat to them. When we parked in the car park, which is a couple of hundred yards from the stadium, I'd stop and chat to them. After games, I'd talk to them. I don't think many of the Chesterfield players had done that. I remember one fan saying to me, I spoke to you more in a year, Fletch, than I spoke to some of our players in five or six years. So, But that was just that's just the way I am. You know, I do that with our fans. I still do it now when I'm out and about. And, and I love to talk and chat. And that's just, you know, installed in me from my parents. You know, be polite and respectful and... And I just think I made a massive effort with him. And I said to Lee Richardson, he was devastated when I said when I went in the office and said, Lee, look, I, I feel I have to go home. And he did everything in his power to try and keep me. But I said, if you could pick this football club up and move it 200 miles closer to my home, 150 miles even, I, I don't want to leave. Because I wasn't leaving Chesterfield to come back to Bournemouth. That would have been different, of course. I would have done that in a heartbeat. And that's no disrespect to Chesterfield, but that's the only club, obviously, Bournemouth, I would have left Chesterfield for. But I didn't have a club, really. I had a few interests, but I didn't have a club. So I literally took a massive gamble at 36 years of age, um, almost 36 years of age. But it, I just felt that that travelling was too far. It was 230 mile, and I, I didn't want to put any strains on my family, you know, for another year. I, I had two years in my mind, but after a year, I thought, no, I, I, I really want to get back home. <laughs> home. Home's hardly full, but no, I class Bournemouth as my home now. But... Um, yeah, Lee was devastated. I was devastated. I did an emotional interview on Chesterfield television. Um, I know some of the fans were crying, and um, yeah, I was very upset. If you like, say, if you could have picked that football club up and moved it closer to, to Bournemouth, I, 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 there was no reason I would leave because I had a great rapport with the fans. And this is a memory that will stick on in my mind, and it's actually on YouTube. Um, it's only about seventeen seconds, but when we played at Saltergate in the last ever game at Saltergate, we played them. Um, we were already promoted hmm. and they had to beat us to stand any chance of getting in the playoffs as it was they did beat us in the last kick of the game they yeah. beat us 2-1 and I remember because I'd got subbed off on the 80th minute and the fans gave me a massive massive stand in evasion and sang my name um, all the Chesterfield fans but anyway after the game I, I promised a lady a Bournemouth lady my shirt and it was the old wooden stand, the main stand, and I, and I walked up after the game and all the fans flooded on the pitch because it was the last game at Salt the Gate. They'd just scored and beat us in the 91st minute. And they must have saw me in the stand and I gave my shirt to the lady because I had my top off. Um, and my mum and dad were at the game and the, the pitch was flooded. I don't know what the fans were. It was eight, ten thousand 10,000 there. And they all started singing my name. So they could have sang wow. any Chesterfield player because I wanted yeah. to talk to the Bournemouth player. They could have sang any Chesterfield fans player. They could have sang a Chesterfield song to do with the club, but they sang my name. Yeah, they might have seen me, but the whole pitch was singing my name. And my dad had tears in his eyes, and he's an old school hard man, and mm -hmm. he don't cry very often. I've never really seen him shed a tear as such, but he had tears in his eyes, and it was just a, it was a strange, bizarre moment because I was like, "Are these singing my name?" This is it was like a surreal moment. I don't know how to describe it, and it was like 
they should have been singing one of their own players' songs or, you know, a team song, but they sang my name for for the whole 30 seconds or a minute that I walked down off the, onto the pitch and back through the tunnel. And that, that little memory is sticks with me and it, it's crazy and it's actually on YouTube. You can hear them singing. Yeah. There's only one Stevie Fletcher. It was it was, an, it was emotional. It was strange and, you know, I absolutely loved it. But that proves that obviously I must have done something right down there with, with the fans because I did have a great relationship with them. I remember, that's what I was kind of saying. I remember going into, like I said, it was like a social club before the game and it was mixed. You had Chesterfield fans and there, Bournemouth fans in there. And I was there, obviously, in the away end. And Chesterfield fans were leaving the social club early because they wanted to see the Bournemouth coach turn up so they could see you. And I remember thinking, well, Fletcher only played for Chesterfield for a year, but there was definitely, you know, I can I can see what you're saying now because there was that feel. I was, I, yeah. I was half surprised at half like, well, they're bound to love Fletch, but it was really nice. They were... Yeah, really fond of you there, which was which was a nice touch, yeah. Mm. Yeah, when I got off the coach on that last game, mm. I'm always one of the last ones off the coach. I, once again, a little bit superstitious. I had to be second last off the coach. And they just the cheer that the fans give me, I thought it was Bournemouth fans. It was actually Chesterfield mm. fans. It was it was it gave me goosebumps and even now when I think back to it, it was it was it was a bit surreal and they were all hugging me and grabbing me and how are you doing and we love you, Fletch. And it was like I was like, Wow, this is because you're right, I was only there a year. I've been yeah. there five or six years or long. Understand, but I thought, you know, it's nice. I was proud. I was proud of myself for once. Um, I thought I must have done something right, and it was half a little bit gutted I didn't spend longer there because it, it, it was an emotional football club. There, they're a bit like Bournemouth. They're like their own, and they're like people who want to play for the club and you know give their all. And if you run around and you work hard and you show passion and desire. Chesterfield's very much in Bournemouth and in that respect they, they, they love you and uh, they take to you and they did take to me and I took to them and you know apart from obviously Bournemouth and maybe my hometown Hartlepool Chesterfield's my next favourite club 100% So when you got the call from Eddie in that minus 17 season Fletch um, I mean what did you think did you think your experience in 94-95 would, would be invaluable to bring into the changing room and get the team over the line? Well, Eddie signed me in end of January, just before deadline day. Um, and he'd lost his first two games, I think, away at Darlington and Rotherham. And we were playing Wickham at home and we were 10 points adrift. And I was thinking when I signed back, I said, almost tell me not to go back. You've had 15 brilliant years, don't go back, don't go back. And it was literally me and Eddie talking on the phone. And then I woke up in the middle of the night one night and I said, turned around to my wife about two o'clock in the morning. I said, I'm going to go back. And she went, are you sure? And I said, yeah. Because if I don't, it's going to play on my mind forever and I don't want any regrets. And she said, but you're going to give up your two-year contract at Crawley. Because obviously I went there, I was only six months into it. She said, for a six-month contract at Bournemouth, less mm -hmm. money, if it doesn't go all right, the club could fall. We know all the, you know, all, all, all the scenario, what could happen, all the, um, all the problems they had. But in my heart, I just couldn't let it lie. It was just playing on my mind. And I spoke to Steve Evans, the manager, and he allowed me to go and he knew the emotion in it and he said like you know if it wasn't anyone but Bournemouth I, I wouldn't let you go Fletch and I said if it was anyone but Bournemouth I wouldn't be in your office Steve asking to go I said but because it's strange you're going in halfway through a season and Crawley were doing well in the, in the conference and I'm asking to leave it's like I didn't mm -hmm. want to leave but obviously when I got wounded Eddie wanted me I couldn't think of anything else and um, we played Wick and we won 3-1 and we closed the gap but every time we got close to closing the gap we'd lose a couple or one or two and the, the gap was always there and looked at the fixtures at the end of the season and seen Chester and Grimsby and all the fans were like, it's going to go down to that game. I'm thinking, oh, no, don't say that. Here we go again. I was hoping it wasn't. I was hoping it was going to be done and dusted, but no, the fans were right and it did. Um, and obviously I wouldn't change it for the world now, looking back. But I did a lot of times stop and think, have I made the right call when I went back? And I was thinking, oh, my God, I'm, I'm coming up 37 years of age and it's an impossible task for us to, to stay in the league. And if we don't do it, what's going to happen? Because I only had till my contract would run out in June and then I've got no club and I'm 37, nearly 38. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? Um, but, you know, it's funny how football changes, doesn't it? And, mm -hmm. you know, in the kick of a football, the kick of a football, your whole life changes, the whole football club can change. And look at us now, it's... Uh, yeah. When they say it's a funny old game, it couldn't be more true of my last few years as a footballer. I'm happy to achieve more in my last three or four years as a player than I did in my first 17, 18. It's, 
it's crazy. So you never know in football what's around the corner. Even like I said, even even at the age I was, but um, I did I did have moments where I thought we ain't gonna do it. There's no way we can close this gap. Um, moments that stand out: dagging them away, Mark Mosley last minute. Oh my god, yeah, incredible. Exeter away where we won three one. We won nil down horrendous at half time, and then we turned it on in style second half because they were at the top of the league or right up there. We were unbelievable. So I went from thinking no chance at half time, we're done. We finished, we've gone as far as we're gonna go. And then forty five minutes later thinking we can do it. And it was like an emotional roller coaster. Um the other games that stood out and then Chester obviously. Um yeah. obviously good yeah. they're, the, they're the four games that stand out in my mind. There might be others that people speak about and I might think, Oh yeah, but for me it was Dagenham, Exeter away, Chester away and then Grimsby at home. They're the mm. big four. Well, for me, of course, personally. we we hear about minus seventeen um, a lot, and obviously everyone's watched the documentary, so we won't talk about the Grimsby moment too much because I'm sure you do pretty much every day of your life. But Tom Jordan, from a fan's point of view, um, we will come over to you and ask you to give your thoughts so Fletch can hear what it was like for a fan. But before we do that, Viv Williams has come back because Willow <laughs> has uh, submitted a very loaded question for you, Fletch, saying, "Who's the best player you've played with apart from me?" In brackets, Willow. Who's the best? Um, see, obviously we had Rio Ferdinand down for, for three months, so you could say he's the best, but I, didn't, I don't really class that because I would probably more speak about who I partnered because obviously I've seen, seen more of him. And um, But listen, for, for a career, you'd have to say Jermaine Defoe. I mean, mm. I know he was on loan for the season, but just saw something in him I'd never, ever seen in, in anyone at our level. And, yeah. You know, we all said he'll go back and he'll be a superstar, and he was. Um, my favourite partner would be James Hater to play yeah. with. I had some great partnerships. You know, I struck a decent partnership with Cots, um, Steve Jones, Mark Steen, obviously Brett towards the end. I mean, mine and Brett's partnership together was fantastic. And obviously his goals and everything, you know, kept the club up as well as, you know, it's not just my goal against Grimsby, it's all the goals that Brett scored. And obviously he was on flame the next season and, you know, got so many goals to get us promoted um, the following season after the Great Escape, uh, the minus 17. So, had some great partnerships. I mean, had good partnerships like Warren Feeney, but James Hater just was so unselfish. It helps when he's one of was one of my best mates. That does help. But I wouldn't even have to ask, and he'd be he'd be sprinting down to close down the fullback, and he'd be doing all the the work, the unselfish work. Um, mm. You know, he'd drop in, he he'd run the channels. He'd even say to me, big man, don't worry, I'll go over and close him down. He'd be like, because he could see if as I was getting older, he, he would help me out. And every time I flicked the header on, he sort of knew where I was going to flick it. We had we went telepathic, but we, we had a good understanding and a good relationship. And um, I don't think I've ever had one angry word or cross word with hates. He's, he's such a nice lad, but we never really had to. Um, and I just feel like I got he got the best out of me hates when, when we played because, like I said, he was very... A very unselfish player, um, and I'm glad he went on to have a decent career. And he's back at the club now, obviously working with the, with the young young lads um, in, in the academy. Um, but yeah. he's such a top man, and uh, I really enjoyed my time with him. He, he, he was brilliant. So, um, if we could just keep you for another ten minutes uh, or so, uh, Fletch, because we'll yeah, just sure. uh, zip through the rest of it. But Tom, yeah, from your yeah. point of view, that Grimsby goal. I mean, you know, one all. Uh, not long to go, and then Fletch pops up. What we, I mean, where were you, and what were your thoughts when that went? I was in the now called Steve Fletcher stand, um, yeah. <laughs> as I always am. But uh, yeah, I, me and I think it was me and five mates. We all won about how much did we win? About 110 quid each. Because all before the game, we all went straight to the bookies, just put on Steve Fletcher to score last. Genuine. We all just put last goal scorer, Steve Fletcher, because I just felt like it's written. But you you know when you always feel like it's written, but then you think, well, is it? But you just, there's that <laughs> thing you have to put it on. And yeah, it was mad. And like, you've seen the documentary and stuff like that. And mostly missing the header and all things. Like that. It just, it was all, all meant for it to happen. But it was a really bizarre game because I just, I think like, like Fletcher alluded to, the games Exeter and Chester, and it felt like we would just beat Grimsby. I thought at home, we'll, we'll get the job done. We're playing well. We'll, we'll be too good for Grimsby. And to go a goal behind really kind of shocked the fans, I think. It was kind of like a party atmosphere and didn't expect that to happen. Um, but that goal from Liam Feeney so early in the second half really set us on our way. And I think Fletch says on the documentary, um, 
that it just felt like oh, we'll just go and get the other goal now and we'll just get get it done and it just went on forever that we just mm. didn't score you just think hang on a minute it's not gonna happen um but yeah the scenes when when the big man scored was just didn't quite make it all the way down with the shirt off but uh at least at least you got halfway down the pitch big one. but um that was i mean was that was that will that be the your greatest ever moment has it got to be yeah yeah 100 percent. Yeah, it has to be like i said boy dream going out of wembley you know get get my first ever and one and only hat trick was an unbelievable mm-hmm. Right. Uh, listen, I'm not blowing my own trumpet because I, I was a League One player. I was a third tier English footballer and for ninety percent of my career. So, but you know, I, I had the stand named after me. That the cutting the ribbon of that. It's a totally. That's a totally different feeling because that's. Yes. It's obviously all related, but it's not on the pitch. So I had some unbelievable times. You look back and you think, wow, wow, I could never have even envisaged hundreds of that growing up as a kid and thinking you could have this. Ahead of you, I mean, I'd have bit your hand off for a hundred games of professional football. Never mind eight hundred and all the things that happened. But Wembley, yeah, the Millennium scoring the first goal, and uh, but the importance of the Grimsby goal, and it was only a league game. In the end of the day, it wasn't. It wasn't a cup final, you know. But it, it meant so much to the town. How much it meant, and I think because obviously I'd sacrificed quite a lot, given my contract up at Crawley, took a massive gamble coming back. The emotions of coming back would it be the same? Playing for my one of my best mates, Eddie, you know, and the accumulation of everything and all the pressure and every day thinking, have I done the right thing? Are we going to survive? Are we not? Where's my career going to go? Where's my life going to go? What's going to happen? And then to score that goal, I think it all poured out of me because at the end of the game, you don't see it on the camera, but when the final whistle went and all the players ran on the pitch, I run past the dugout into the family stand, which was the B block towards obviously the other end and ran up the steps and grabbed my wife and kids and was just crying in their arms. And um, I think my wife knew how much, how much it meant. Um, because like I say, it, it, it'd been a, a massive roller coaster of emotions. And when, when you sort of, and obviously didn't put my family's, you know, health at risk or anything like that. But I, I did gamble a lot with it because like I say, you, I was coming back and I could have been jobless and I, I, I felt like, you know, I, I'd sort of gambled a little bit with, with with my family for me doing it and was it the right call and um, and thankfully it was and, you know, it's changed my life as well um, and that moment will always stick with me and I think, yeah, yeah I have to say that is my most favourite, favourite moment in football. It, it meant so much to the town, to the fans, to the manager, you know, obviously coming in and it was amazing what he'd done and to my teammates because we went and got promoted with the same team the next year and that togetherness. So I've never known a team spirit like it. It was it was phenomenal. And once again, I, it was another growing up stage for me. I might have been 30, 36, 37, but you know, I once again added another string to my ball of growing up and experiencing different things. And um, yeah, that one game, I would say, changed my life dramatically. Yeah. What's it like, Fletch, to have a stand named after you? while you're still actually a player? Well, it, it, I remember what happened, we were playing away. And um, ironically, it was the next season, it was uh, Grimsby away. And um, before we left to go on the coach, he said to me, uh, Chairman, I'll see you upstairs. I was like, oh, no, what have I done? Not again. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I haven't done anything wrong this time. I'm more mature. I haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. Surely, you might just... Might just want something normal. And uh, I went in the office and Eddie Mitchell put my mind to rest. He said, come in, relax. It's okay. Nothing to worry about. I was like, oh, thank God for that. He said, uh, I was just thinking about renaming the, um, the North Stand after you as a Steve Fletcher stand. And our August was like, looked at him as if to say, you are winding me up, Eddie, aren't you? But, you know, Eddie being Eddie Mitchell. And he looked at me and was like, I'm being serious. And I was like, I just don't know what to say. I'm for once lost for words it was like <laughs> proud honoured humbled I, I didn't know what to say back because what do you say when someone says to you we're going to name the stand up to you it's like you can't just say oh thank you very much that's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> you can't. it's like you have, you, it's like one of them moments where you go yeah and I didn't know what to say I just couldn't I, I said I'm really sorry I said I don't know what to say I mean I just I was almost in tears and then I got back on the coach and obviously Eddie, Eddie, the manager, knew, and he said, "Okay." He said, "Are you happy?" I went, "Am I happy?" I said, "I just can't believe it." And I was I had tears in my eyes, 
and obviously Eddie Mitchell had discussed it with Eddie beforehand and and Eddie said no you deserve it big man and I was like I just can't believe it and I just couldn't wait to get onto the phone to my parents but I couldn't because I was on the coach with the players and I didn't <laughs> yeah. want them to overhear it because Eddie told me to keep it under wraps I don't think I'm, I had to go on a long journey to Grimsby before I could get off the coach to phone my family, and my wife and my mum and dad and tell them what had just happened. So I had to keep it bottled up inside me for about five or six hours before I could tell anyone, oh, it was horrendous. And I was bursting inside just to, to say something to someone, but I couldn't. And then, you know, ever since, I always look up at that stand and just think, wow. And Chris Temple come to me once and he said, I think they tried to find out if any other player had a stand named after them while they were still playing. Obviously, usually when people retire or they they pass away, the stand gets named after them. But there was nobody come back from any club up and down the country, and I think even in even in Europe where they had had a stand named after them while they still played. So, you know, I, I, it's something you can't describe. I, I don't know what to say apart from like say I'm so honoured, humbled, and proud. It's um, I'm proud for my parents. I'm I'm happy for my parents because I, I put myself in their position now, and. It, you know, if that was my son or daughter um, and something like that happened to them, how, how I would feel. So that one was that one was for my parents that, that I think growing up and always wanting to be a professional footballer and all the, the effort they gave me of driving me everywhere, picking me up, like they all do and all parents are the same, you know, when they want their son or daughter to be the best they can be at any, any mm -hmm. job, not just sport but anything. And they, they sacrifice their lives to give you your dreams, your hopes, everything I wanted as a boy and so for me I would always say that name of the stand is in honour of my parents and, and what they mm -hmm. sacrificed to allow me to be a professional footballer and have the career I had. Mm. So yeah as you just said you know we got promotion from League One as well and that was that was when you announced your retirement and do you sort of look back and think you know do you think you could have done a job in the championship? I didn't know. I didn't know which way it was going to go with Eddie. Eddie Howe, obviously, in, in the office. Uh, we celebrated with the open top bus, and then the next day I had to go in for a meeting. And I thought, is he going to give me another year? Is he going to have me around as a player? Maybe I know I haven't played much. Obviously, when he come back, I'd only had eleven, 11 appearances that season uh, off the bench. I didn't start a game, but listen, I was forty. I was nearly forty-one. I was one month away from being forty-one. Um, I wasn't sure. Um, and Eddie hadn't really told me. I don't think he'd made his mind up. I don't know. I mean, I've never really discussed it with him. And we sat and we talked about it and he said, look, Big, and he said, I want to go down a different avenue a little bit. He said, I'm not saying you should retire, but, you know, I don't, I don't see how you can carry on if I'm not playing. He said, I know how much you love to play. He said, I don't want to see that hurt in your face when I'm not, invo not even involving you in, in the squads. You know, like, obviously... Being, being on the bench or he said because I know how much you love football and I don't want to hurt you and take it away I mean you remember we're best friends and he was so compassionate and he almost was didn't want to say that he's not giving me a contract but he was almost telling me to you know just think about it and and where I want to go because he didn't rush me he said look I've had a few offers from you and he named a few teams who, who've come in for me and I was thinking wow at least people still want me and I'm nearly 41 yeah. but I knew it would only be for a year and of course, if Eddie hadn't offered me to go into a scouting role and, and be in the scouting department, um, he wanted to bring the scouting department on. He said, I want you to be a major part of that. I want you around everyone. I still want you coming out in training every now and then. And the way he, he played it to me, I said straight away, I said, I don't want to go to any of the other clubs. I'm not going to go to these clubs who want me. I said, I want to stay here with you. And I sort of like, within two minutes of finding out I was not going to be a professional footballer anymore after 23, 24 years, my mind just switched into still being around. It was it was strange. I, I can't describe it. It was like I should have been in floods of tears. And for one second I was, but then as soon as the way Eddie put it, he, he's so compassionate because I know he, he loves me and I love him. And he, he could see the hurt in me, but then he just changed it. And the way he said that he still wanted me around, he wanted me a big part of it. And, you know, there's no way I want you to leave the football club. I straight away said, no, I'll retire. I'm not bothered. I don't want to go anywhere else. I just want to be here with you and the team and uh, and do whatever I can to, you know, help the football club. And um, I never even thought about going to another club to finish my career. And I even said, right, if I was on 999 games, I still wouldn't have went to another club to get my thousandth appearance. I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Um, 
the time was right. I just one I wasn't I wasn't sure, so I wasn't 100 percent expecting it, but it was the right thing to do. And once again, Eddie Eddie's call and he got it right because. I think it would have been heartbreaking for me to, if he'd given me another year and I wasn't in the squads and I wasn't travelling away or I was never, I was just basically a training player that wouldn't be in a nice way to go out. So Eddie had obviously thought long and hard about it and it was the right decision looking back. Um, straight away, within, like I say, a few minutes, my mind was focusing on the next stage of my career and being around Eddie and the team and the boys and helping them achieve great things in, in the championship. Mm. Yeah. At what point on the journey to the Premier League did you think we were going to do it and we were on something really special? Well, um, first of all, you look at the Championship and you've seen the clubs in there and I was a scout and I was thinking, wow, we've got it all on just to stay in this league. Mm -hmm. Only once before we'd ever got up, was it once, twice? I don't know, 87 yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Harry, but I was looking at the clubs and the... And the, and the size of the clubs, thinking, gee, wow, so many big clubs in here. How are we going to cope with playing teams like that? And then we got off to a decent start. I think, didn't we beat Charlton? Mm, did, yeah. Yeah. Didn't we beat Charlton at home, yeah? Yeah, 1 0, yeah. Um, or 2 no, 2 1, sorry. Thought, yeah, and I thought, I thought we'd be all right. And we signed some good players. The team had evolved so much, and Truin had evolved, and Eddie had evolved. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, this is a million miles from even just last year or the year before and um, signed some top players and we done really well and we had a little push towards the end of our first year. We almost got in the playoffs. I know we just missed out. Oh, that's my mum saying so proud of you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. <laughs> Love you. Um, and um, we almost made it and uh, we just missed out by a couple of points and I was thinking, we've got a chance next year, you know. We, we could be dark horses and I never thought to get promoted automatically. I was just thinking we could we could nick in the playoffs. And then as it got further up and I was going to the games as well. I was asking Eddie if I could come to the games. I should have been out scouting towards the end, but I was like, I'll do midweek games more and can I just come to a couple of the games? And he'd look at me, I was going, Oh please let me come and uh yeah, as good as gold he let me come. So I was away. I went to the uh, Reading away. I took my daughter where we won one nil and some of the home games and it was awful because when you're a player, you can affect it on the pitch and you feel you don't feel any nerves when you're watching. Oh, my God, the anxiety and the nerves. And I was biting my skin on my hands and my nails. And I was coming back like a nervous wreck. And I said to my wife, it's horrible because you can't do anything about it. When Even when you're on the bench, you think I can come on and make an impact and maybe change it. But when when you're just watching, I mean, God knows what Eddie feels like every week. I don't know. I don't know how he does it, but it's... Um, it's a different type of nerves. It's it's horrible. I hate it. I don't enjoy watching the games unless we're two, three nil up and there's two or three minutes to play. I do not enjoy watching them. I love watching how us play football, but the games. Not so much. No, mate, uh, there's so much riding on it. I, I don't enjoy it. But when we got towards the end, it was like, and especially the Bolton game, I was like, this is this is surreal. It's crazy. What the hell is going on here? There's no way we're going to be. There's no way we're going to beat Bolton. And go in the Premier League. It can't happen. It won't happen to us. And then, um, obviously, all the interviews, I was going, yeah, we'll do well. We'll be born, I think. On. But deep inside, I was thinking, it won't happen. There's no way we're going to be in the Premier League. Are you winding me up? <laughs> and uh, that night, I was with Stephen Purchase, um, stood in the concourse area of the, in between where the director's boxes are, and we watched the games from there. And when we scored that second and third goal, Stephen Purgis and me was just clinging on to me, he jumped in my arms and the celebrations with the chairman and it was just phenomenal. I had tears in my eyes. I think the cameras, Sky was at the game and they looked up and they caught me with tears in my eyes. It was just incredible. And then I, Eddie said to me, I can come on the pitch at the end as well. So I got out and I got my name read out on the Guess pitch. And the fans were still got a massive cheer. I was like, this is <laughs> just... It felt like I was a kid at Disney World for the first time. It was... It was incredible, and then I was still in the scouting department. I thought, wow, now I've got to be on my game because mm. I'm looking for Premier League players now. I ain't just looking for championship players or good potential. I've got now it all on. And then all of a sudden, that business or the work minded side of me, you know, got triggered in, and I was thinking, oh, wow, this is going to be some summer. So it was crazy because. Six months later, I was I was on the coaching department. Eddie just one day just said to me, we were opening a school up or something or a doctor's surgery. And he said to me, why don't you come over this week and just spend the week with his trainer? And I was like, I would love to. Why didn't you ask me two years ago? <laughs> oh, wow. and, uh, 
and and it just, just took off from there. He said, "We'll see how we go at the end of the season." He said, "You can still do your scouting a little bit, but come on, we could do with helping out and the coaching." So I went over, and I was obviously running around doing everything and an extra pair of hands and. And then at the end of that, that year, so I went over in about the end of January. I'll tell you when it was. We'd just beaten. The first, my first game was Portsmouth away in the FA Cup. where We beat them 2-1, I think. Yeah. yeah. That was my first game. My first yeah. away game was Crystal Palace away where Mark Pugh and... A phobie. A phobie scored, I think. Yeah. 2-1. Mm, yeah. 2-1, yeah. yeah. And that was my first Premier League game. Yeah, that was the Tuesday after it, I think. Um, mm. And uh, at the end of that season, Eddie said, look, you know, crack on with your badges and... I want you to stay over on the coaching side. How do you feel about it? I said, absolutely love it. And you know, four years later, I'm still there, thankfully, because of obviously Eddie's. Eddie wanted me to come over and you know be alongside him, and it's 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 fabulous. Every day is every day is a, is a treat, is a pleasure, and watching them players train when they're on it. Um, and this week, while we've since I've been back in, um, just to see the players again after being away from them from eleven weeks it is brilliant. And, the training's been really good and intense and enjoyable and the players have loved it. And to see Brooksy back and it just feels special oh, at the moment. I just thought we can carry that on. In um in three words, can you tell me what you feel you bring the AFC Bournemouth coaching department? Ooh <laughs> not enough. <laughs> <laughs> the players know they can speak to me, so Ed likes me to be around the players and making sure they're all right and speaking to them and any little problems <laughs> I can deal with it myself. I don't need, I don't need to go to Eddie every two minutes, um, telling him things. You know, I can, I, I know the players. I've played with a lot. You know, Fran or Charlie Daniel, Darren Smith, mm-hmm. all them players. And obviously, we had Harry Arter and Pewie. I, I played alongside them for, for a few mm-hmm. years. So, you know, I, they trust me. I, I, I believe in, and I speak to them all the time and. If there's anything Eddie needs to know, and I feel he should, obviously I'll tell him everything, everything he needs to know, but I can deal with certain things and just take a bit of weight from him in that department. Obviously, in training, he can rely on me to set things up and, and, and organise. He, he does he does now and then allow me to, you know, take the players for a little bit of head in and to help take the strikers, and he gets me involved. I still join in. Um, basically, whatever Eddie wants. I yeah. mean, some weeks when we have big groups, don't need to join in as much. Obviously, I set everything up with me and Simon Weatherstone, and obviously we have Steve Purchase. We go out, we set everything up, me and Simon, on the morning, and we go out about an hour before the players, and Eddie come out, and we set all, everything up. Eddie comes out, and he tweaks it how he wants it. His drills are quite complex, as you can imagine, and you know he moves things around, and sometimes gets the ump, and sometimes he doesn't. And um, But, you know, he's always thankful. He always thanks and, and says how well we've done, and... And then we, walk, we we sometimes join in training. We seem to join in more when it's smaller groups um, so we can make the drills work because sometimes it works better with seven, eight players. But when you've only got four or five, the staff are used quite a lot. So Stephen mm-hmm. Purchase, Eddie joins in, Jason Tindall and Simon Weatherstone, myself. So we're, we're used quite a lot. But obviously, you're training alongside Premier League players so yeah. you've got to be right on it. And I'm like, I feel like saying, Eddie, I am nearly 48. Uh, <laughs> just to remind you, but he's just no chance if I'm, in, if I'm in the drill, I'm, I have to be on it. My touch has to be good. My passes have to be wrapped in. They have to be crisp. I'm a technically better player now since I retired. Than <laughs> and well, that's... Yeah. Like a, see me jumping there, I yeah. always worry about catching the lads with the elbows, so I always keep my elbows down now because <laughs> I came into training once when we were in the championship and within one session, I smashed Tommy Elphick and I <laughs> knocked out. I knocked out Matt, Matt Ritchie in the same session and Eddie was like, big and <laughs> you're training, you're joining in, and you're still playing. And <laughs> back into Matt Ritchie, knocked him clean out. That was an accident. Jumped up for a header with Tommy, smashed him, <laughs> put him up. I was like, I've got to calm it down. So now when I jump with the players, <laughs> I jump with my arms down as much as I can. And you know, Ed still wants me to give him a little bit, but it's it's a fine balance now. He's like, yes. big and mm. big and 50%, 50%. Not too much. Uh, well, I don't. I mean, I'll be devastated with with that question. I did ask for it in three words, but I, I absolutely love the fact you gave us that full. Uh, yeah, super. I mean, it, I've got to say, it's um, Tommy Alfick said, and I was really surprised he said this as a current footballer for a for a club that's in the championship. He said since leaving Bournemouth, 
he's not felt as though he's got what he's needed from training. So obviously from us, he went to Villa, he's been to Huddersfield and he said training is never as good. And I'm sure you're as much as part of that as of course, Eddie and JT and Simon Weatherston, et cetera. So, you know, some really nice compliments there, I think. And um, by the way, I am aware that we said one hour earlier on, on Instagram and we've gone well over it. So Jeff, we'll do some quick fire questions to finish, shall we? Yeah, let's do that. Um, Jamie Allen's got one. Worst dressed teammate, Fletch. Worst dressed teammate. Well, <laughs> of late, it had to be Pewey. I mean, he is the nicest player. And I know it's a it's a phrase that gets banded around. Oh, he's a lovely lad. He's the nicest person I know. Let me tell you, Mark Pugh is the nicest bloke I know, not just in football. He He loves... His love for football, love for the club, love for his family, the way he conducts himself, the way he speaks, the way he is with the fans, the amount of time, effort he gives to people outside of the game, you know, is is just phenomenal. And obviously that's something I, I did myself and I, and I sorely appreciate what he does and how he did it and how he conducts himself. Um, but his gear, <laughs> every time he walks, the lads would just... The lads... Because he's so nice, he never used to get the proper stick. But as he would just leave the building or walk out of the where we eat together in the canteen, someone would go, nice shorts, Pewey. <laughs> and he would just start laughing. <laughs> just by people laughing. They didn't, because he's so nice, they didn't want to take the mick out of him and give him too much banter. But right at the end, someone would just throw a little <laughs> comment in. he just turn around and go, I'm okay on that. What do you mean I'm okay on that? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, mate, mate, you look horrendous. You're horrendous. <laughs> you can't be dressed like that. But yeah, uh, I'm, I'm from a little village, and maybe they don't have too many nice clothes shops. There. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, also, He's, uh, footballers always pride themselves on their dress, and everyone thinks they're outdoing each other, and blah blah blah. It's, it's a bit like that now. But Pewie just didn't care. He just just wear his gear, whether he thought he looked good or not. He didn't. He, he didn't care. You know, I'm not bothered Fletch me like, you know what I mean? I'm not bothered and I'm thinking <laughs> you're gonna get so much, you're gonna get so much stick when you walk in that changing room. But he didn't get it verbally too much, but people would just look at each other with the eyes going, What is he wearing? That's so fair. I tell you gets a bit of stick now and I don't know why, but Come you've on. got it in for him. Gozor gets a bit of stick off Fran How does he? Adam Smith. Yeah, because obviously the listen, the boys have got you know, can get what they want and uh, and they have you know accessible money to their disposal which they can just go and buy loads of nice gear but Gozo will buy something and then they walk in and they'll hang it up and they're like and I'm thinking it ain't too bad but the standards of the boys now you can imagine so Gozo will come in and Fran will just go what are you wearing and then Adam Smith will start on him and he's like what what and he gets absolute healthy <laughs> from Fran and Smudge and then others like Callum Wilson will start on him as well and then they come in from training and then they put it on a coat hanger and they've, they've hung it up uh, just for everyone to see. I don't think it's that bad. Listen, it's nowhere near on the level of Huey. But he does take a bit of stick, he does take a bit of stick from Frano, especially in, in Adam Smith. Love it. And um, finally, just um, this one from uh, Blazers for Goalpost. You said you're forced to spend the rest of your life on a desert island with one Bournemouth player that you've played with. Who would it be? <laughs> Wow, what a question that is. That's a good question. I, what, how long for? Well, for the rest of your life, I suppose, yeah. For the rest of your life, I'll put it on screen so you can see. Uh, Desert Island, one Bournemouth player that you've played with, who's he going to be? Uh, he, he's my best mate in football, Neil Young. Neil Young. Yeah, Fair play. Neil Young. He's over, in, he's, over, yeah, he's over in Australia and Adelaide. Yeah, he's been over there since 2008, I believe, mm. uh, when I was at Chesterfield. So he was my best best friend in football, yeah. Mm. yeah. Good stuff. Good. Um, well, Fletch, it's been an absolute pleasure. Tom, uh, final words to Fletch? Yeah, thanks for everything, big man. You know, we, you know we all love you. So um, really appreciate you coming on, mate. And just cheers for everything you're doing and continue to do for the football club. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? My pleasure. Loved it, mate. My favourite moment this season, Fletch, was that team talk you gave. Was it after the Villa game? Loved it. Yeah. Yes, it was. And, you know, that's another little memory. I talked about all the little things that, and, and the camera was there. I didn't even realise and they got pictures of it and Eddie spoke about it in, in the press and uh, he just, it was an impromptu thing. He just said, digging, 
because I used to do that when when we were going in that great escape minus seventeen. He used to let me do the team talks at the end in the huddle, and we got together after the Villa, and I think it was a lot of emotion, and we stood in front of obviously the Steve Fletcher stand, the North stand, and we got together in a huddle, and he went, "Yes, Biggin," and he wanted me, and I just said it from the heart, and I spoke for about twenty seconds about the pride, the passion, you know, my love, our love for the football club, what we give, and I just poured it out, and all the players come to me afterwards and said, "Fletch, that was that was brilliant. I loved it, and it just it was so." instinctive I, I almost it was better that I didn't have a time to plan it because if he'd have said mm. to me a couple of minutes before or when the game finished I want you to do the talk in the huddle I'd have panicked and probably got it wrong and it was literally I had three or four seconds to just think about something and I just spoke about the passion and the pride and you know I wanted I am to be in, in this squad and what, what we've got here is, is second to none don't let anyone take that away yeah. from us and then it was, it was another special moment and one that will live with me forever. It felt to me like you were every fan doing that team talk because we, yeah. we were all on that pitch doing it with you. Yeah, definitely. I, I can understand, yeah, mate. It was a very, very, uh, very proud moment. Uh, thank you for that. Good stuff. Well, Fletch, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to everyone that's taken part. Uh, whether you submit a question beforehand or afterwards or during the show, I really appreciate it. Um, do remember to give us a like and a subscribe as well, because we'll uh, be having Jan Kermigan and also some more ex-AFCB legends uh, until the start of the Premier League season. It's the only time that we'll really be able to do this feasibly. So we're just lucky to be able to be joined by you know legends such as Fletch. Um, so, yeah, give us a like on the video and also subscribe too. And yeah, from one striking talent to another, it's Jan Kermigan. He is coming up on Thursday. So we're looking forward to that and we'll see you in the next video. Up the cherries. Good.